First causes. How can I tell if I am working A right? Many students ask us. And how can I be sure I am following correct lines? Is the question in the mind of many a man and woman when confronted by some unusual problem? In his Edinburgh lectures, Judge Troward gave so clear an answer to this question that I quoted here, if we regard the fulfillment of our purpose as contingent upon any circumstances, past, present, or future, we are not making use of first cause. We have descended to the level of secondary causation, which is the region of doubts, fears, and limitations. What is first cause? Judge Troward defined it, too. If a lighted candle is brought into a room, the room becomes illuminated, if the candle is taken away. It becomes dark again. Now the illumination and the darkness are both conditions, the one positive resulting from the presence of the light, the other negative resulting from its absence. From this simple example, we, therefore, see that every positive condition has an exactly opposite negative condition corresponding to it, and that this correspondence results from their being related to the same cause, the one positively and the other negatively. And hence we may lay down the rule that all positive conditions result from the active presence of a certain cause, and all negative conditions from the absence of such a cause. A condition, whether positive or negative, is never the primary cause, and the primary cause of any series can never be negative, for negation is the condition which arises from the absence of active causation. How can you be sure that you are working A right? By asking yourself one question, on what am I putting my dependence for the riches, or the health, or the success I am seeking? If the answer is upon my ability, or my doctor, or his drugs, or the help of my friends, then you can rate your chances of success as not more than 1 in 10, for you are working with secondary causes and secondary causes are always undependable. But if your answer is I am throwing everything I have into my work, but I am putting my dependence for success not on this means but on the unquenchable, irresistible power of the seed of life working through me, why then you can count your chances of success as 9 out of 10. You see, it all comes back to the fundamental law of the universe that each nucleus, each seed, contains within itself vitality enough to draw to it every element it needs for its complete growth and fruition. But the seed must germinate, and the nucleus must start whirling before it either has the slightest attractive power. Until they do that, they are so much congealed life, with no more pull to them than any other bit of inanimate matter around them. Suppose you want something badly more than anything else life can offer you at the moment. The desire for that something forms a nucleus, a seed, and like every other seed, it has latent in it the power to draw to itself the elements necessary for its complete growth and fruition. But until you do something about it, it is an inanimate nucleus, a seed that has not been planted, a nucleus with no power of attraction because no one has taken the trouble to start it whirling. How can you put it to work? By planting your seed in other words, by making your start. What is the first thing you would do if you knew you would get your desire? What is the first step you would take in its accomplishment? Take IT. Do something to start, no matter how small a scale. To begin, you know, is to be half done. Make the accomplishment of that desire the sine qua non of your existence, give to it all the thought and energy and riches you have to bring it into being, and leave all other considerations in second place until you have won what you want. That is the way great fortunes are made. That is the way miracles are performed. That is the only way you can put life into the nucleus of your desires and start them whirling and drawing to you whatever things you need for their manifestation. Conditions, obstacles they don't matter. Disclaim them, disregard them, and lay claim to the thing you want regardless of conditions. Like the seed in rocky soil, they may force your nucleus to work harder, to whirl faster, but give it vitality enough, and it will draw what it needs from the ends of the earth. So don't work on poverty. Don't work on debts. That will merely bring more of these undesirables to you. Work on your idea, work on your nucleus belief that you receive and you will speedily draw to you all the riches you need to fill out the vacuums now caused by poverty and debts. You have seen shoots of trees spring up on rocky ledges where there was scarcely enough nourishment to keep a bit of moss alive. And you have known such shoots to grow into mighty trees. How did they do it? The seed of a tree is a nucleus. Plant it, and the first thing it does after it heats and germinates is to burst its shell and send forth a shoot upward using for that purpose the energy latent in the seed itself. In other words, it reaches out first to express life. It uses all the power it has to bring forth fruit. When it finds it has not enough energy in itself to accomplish this, it puts forth roots to draw the necessary elements from the soil about. But if it happens to have fallen on a rocky ledge, 
it soon finds there is not enough soil to give it moisture or nourishment. Does it then despair? Not a bit of it. It sends its roots into every tiny crevice until they reach moisture and nourishment. It actually splits giant rocks asunder in its search for nutriment. It burrows through or around any obstacle until it exhausts the last flicker of life in itself or gets what it wants. Wherever they are, whatsoever may stand between, the shoot of the tree sends its roots seeking every element it needs for its growth and fruition. First the stalk then the roots. First the need then the means to satisfy that need. First the nucleus then the elements needed for its growth. The seed is a primary cause. The need, and the nucleus, both are primary causes. Conditions they are secondary. Given enough life in the nucleus, it will draw to itself the necessary means for growth regardless of conditions. The life in the seed is what counts not the place where it falls. All through nature, you will find that same law. First the need, then the means. Use what you have to provide the vacuum, then draw upon the necessary elements to fill it. Reach up with your stalk, spread out your branches, provide the pull and you can leave to your roots the search for the necessary nourishment. If you have reached high enough, if you have made your magnet strong enough, you can draw to yourself whatever elements you need, no matter if they are at the ends of the earth I God formed a seed of life which is you. He gave it the power to attract to itself everything it needs for its growth, just as he did with the seed of the tree. He gave it the power to draw to itself everything it needs for the fruition of its desires, just as he did with the tree. But he did even more for you. He gave your seed of life power to attract to itself everything it needs for its infinite expression. He asks of you only that you make your desires strong enough, your faith in their drawing power great enough, to attract to you anything necessary to their fruition. You see, life is intelligent. Life is all-powerful. And life is always and everywhere seeking expression. What is more, it is never satisfied. It is constantly seeking greater and fuller expression. The moment a tree stops growing, that moment the life in it starts seeking elsewhere for means to better express itself. The moment you stop expressing more and more of life, that moment life starts looking around for other and better outlets. The only thing that can restrict life is the channel through which it works. The only limitation upon it is the limitation you put upon it. Over in Japan, they have taken the shoots of oak trees, and by binding a wire tightly around the main root at the point where the trunk begins, they have stunted the growth to such an extent that instead of great oaks 80 or 100 feet high, these shoots reproduce all their qualities in dwarf trees 12 or 14 inches in height. These stunted trees live as long as regular trees, but they express only the millionth part of the life an oak should manifest. We look upon that as abnormal, and so it is, yet it is being done all around us every day. Men bind their subconscious minds with wires of fear and worry. They put clamps of limitation upon their channels of supply. Then they wonder why they don't express more life in their bodies, why more happiness and comfort are not evidenced in their surroundings. God put a seed of himself into you. That seed he called desire. He gave it infinite power to draw to itself whatever it needs for expression. But he gave you free will in other words, he left it with you to direct that expression to draw upon it to the full or put clamps upon it, as you like. There lies in you the aegis of a Napoleon, a Lincoln, an Edison. Anything you wish. All that is necessary is to stir up the seed of God in you and give it channels for expression. You can be what you want to be if you want it strongly enough if you believe in it firmly enough to make it your dominant desire. How did Annette Kellerman, from a hopelessly crippled child, become one of the world's most perfectly formed women? By stirring up the seed of life in her limbs, through her earnest desire for strength and beauty, by giving them work to do, ways in which to express life. How did George Jowett, from a cripple at 11, become the world's strong man at 21? By stirring up the seed of life in him through his overmastering desire to be strong by giving his muscles first a little, then more and more work to do. How did Reza Khan, from an ordinary trooper in the Persian army, rise to the rulership of Persia? How did a water boy win the throne of Afghanistan? One and all, they stirred up the seed of life in them through desire and faith. One and all, they reached up and out, using freely all the power they had in the serene confidence that there was plenty more behind. Obstacles? They knew that obstacles were merely negative conditions that would disappear as darkness disappears when you turn on the light. It was the prize they kept their eyes upon. And it was the prize that they reached out for and plucked. A few years ago, if anyone had told the neighbors of these men that today they would be rulers, he would have been laughed at as crazy. Why just look at their position, 
he would have been told. Look at their circumstances, their surroundings. Look at the condition of the country. Consider their lack of training, experience. Conditions all of them. Secondary causes. And these men had the vision to see beyond them to go back to the primary cause the seed of God in themselves. They opened new channels for it to express itself. They reached up their stalks and spread out their branches and the seed of life in them drew to itself every element needed to bring forth their fruit. At the heart of you is a seed the seed of God, the seed of life. In it is a perfect body, just as in every acorn there is a perfect oak. Not only that but there is the power in it to draw to you every element you need to manifest a perfect body. What do you care if circumstances have conspired to make you sick, crippled or weak or infirm or ugly, or old? If you are, it is because you or those around you have put the clamps of your fears or wrong beliefs upon the seed of life in you and certain of your organs are stunted or dying. The remedy? It is simple. Remove the clamps. Disregard your infirmity? It is only a condition a lack of life. Then stir up the seed of life in you. Stir it up and charge it to draw to itself every element necessary to fill out the perfect image of your body that is in the seed. Impossible? Have you ever heard of anything that is impossible to God? It is a seed of God that is in you, and there is nothing of good it cannot draw to you. The law you sue say what you have and more will be given to you. Let me not ask how difficult may be the work assigned to me. This only do I ask, is this my task? Let me not ask if I be strong enough, or if the road be rough. I only ask today, is this the way? Claude Weimer Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, said Jesus. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruits, ye shall know them. What did Jesus mean by bearing fruit? Didn't he have in mind methods of expressing the seed of life in you, making opportunities for it to expand and reach out to all those you come in contact with? doing something that makes this world a better place to live in? And how does a tree go about bearing fruit? It brings forth a fragrant blossom first, does it not? When the blossom goes, it leaves the pistol, which gradually ripens into the luscious fruit. The blossom is any idea of service, any means for making life more comfortable or enjoyable for those you live or deal with. The pistol is the action of turning that blossom into the beginning of the fruit by taking the first step to start the service, no matter how small that step may be. The luscious fruit is the finished service. That's fine. I can hear many say, I have the blossom oh, a most fragrant blossom but no means for turning it into the pistol or the fruit. What does the branch have with which to start fruit? Enough nourishment for a start, but nothing over. Do you see the branch worrying about that account? Not a bit of it it uses cheerfully everything it has, serene in the knowledge that providing more is the vine's problem. The branch has only to supply the need. The more it finds use for, the more it gets. Another branch may be just as big, but if the first one bears twice as much fruit, it will get twice as much nourishment, for the vine apportions its life-giving forces not by size, but by needs. Wasn't it Jesus who said I am the vine, ye are the branches? Can you draw on him for more than he can provide? Straight from a mighty bow this truth is driven, they fail, and they alone, who have not striven. They have a proverb in the East that a road of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Gouda expressed the thought when he wrote Are you in earnest? Seize this very minute, what you can do, or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Only engage, and then the mind grows heated, begin, and then the work will be completed if ye abide in me, promise the Master, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. For herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. If you stir up the seed of life in you by strong desires, if you provide it channels through which to express itself by taking the first step towards the accomplishment of those desires, you can ask for any element you need, and it will be given to you. But if you lose this day loitering, it will be the same story tomorrow and the day after. That which you are today is the fulfillment of yesterday's aspirations, that which you are tomorrow will be the achievement of today's vision. You can't stand still. You must go forward or backward. Eternal progress is the law of being. If you meet its call, you will never fail to go on and on to greater and greater heights. As Florence Taylor so aptly put it success is the sum of small efforts, repeated day in and day out, with never a thought of frustration, with never a moment of doubt. Whatever your cherished ambition, begin now to make it come true through efforts, repeated, untiring, plus faith in the thing that you do. 
health, riches, love they are all means to an end, they are all conditions. The seed of life in you is the only thing that counts that, and the channels you give it for expression. There is your primary cause all else is secondary. So disregard all else, and keep going back to it. Do you want love? The mere desire is a proof of the availability of the love you want, for someone has rightly defined desire as God tapping at your door with his infinite supply. So plant the seeds of love by giving it to all you come in contact with. Plant the seeds freely, serenely, believingly, and the harvest is as sure as when you plant seeds of wheat in fertile ground. Make it a practice to appreciate things and people. Use it all through the day whenever anything occurs that pleases you. Say silently, if you cannot do so audibly, I appreciate you. And never miss an opportunity to say a kindly word of praise or thanks to those around you. As Amy Bauer puts it we never know how far kind words may go. There is no way to measure friendly smiles. They carry treasures of courage, faith, and love of man. And we may watch them grow until their warmth infolds a multitude, returns to bless the giver too with the bread of happiness. A good affirmation to use is I so love that I see all good and give all good, and all good comes back to me. Do you want riches? Wealth is largely a matter of consciousness. Many persons who want money, and who are striving for money, actually tend toward driving it away from them by reason of their tenseness of thought and their failure to realize the money consciousness. In order to handle millions, one must learn to think in the terms and ideas of millions. Harriman once expressed this pregnant truth when he said, It is just as easy to think and to talk in millions as in single dollars. This wizard of finance, whose feats were regarded by the public as closely approaching those of ledger domain, made this adage one of his cardinal principles of thought and action. He thought and talked in millions and his thought took form in action his mental states took on material form his ideas became realities. There are many men in this country in every city in this country who have within them the germ powers which, if allowed to develop and grow, would cause these men to become second Harrimans, or second Morgans, or even second Rockefellers. But practically none of these persons ever will really develop into this stage, in fact, the probability is that they will evolve merely into successful small shopkeepers, small newsstand keepers, or even small peanut stand men successful, in each case, but always on a small scale. They are content to think in single dollars even in dimes instead of thinking in millions. They manifest realities in the direct ratio of their ideals. Their thought takes form in actions of like caliber. Their mental states are reproduced in material form, but they are the same size in both subjective pattern and objective form. Just where thou art, shine forth and glow, just where thou art, tis better so, serve thou the Lord with perfect heart, not somewhere else, but where thou art. Emerson had a saying that you could travel the world over in search of beauty, but unless you had it within yourself, you would never find it, and the same is true of every good thing in life. The first step to success lies right where you are and in what you are doing. Until you have learned the lesson your present work holds for you, until you have learned to do it joyfully, lovingly, as to the Lord, you have not taken that first step towards the goal of your ambitions. You have not really begun. Supply is an active force. It goes only to those who are alive, who are providing so many and such powerful magnets for it that they can pull it to themselves regardless of what obstacles may come between. But suppose it is health you want? Suppose you are crippled or blind or bedridden. den? What then? Why then your remedy lies in breaking up the congealed life in your afflicted organ, and pouring it anew into the perfect mold. And the way to break it up is by giving all you have of life to that one desire, by working up so intense a feeling that it shall presently burst its shell and draw to it every element it needs for its perfect expression. You can't do that by dabbling in mental work, while you are depending partly upon drugs, partly upon other means. You must feel so strongly that your salvation lies in the seed of God within you, you must believe so utterly in its power, that you are willing to sink or swim by it alone. Like Grant, you must have the grim determination to fight it out along those lines, if it takes all summer. But it will not take all summer. Once you get the spirit of it, you will find it by far the speediest and surest method there is. Often your relief will be immediate. A writer in Unity tells of a friend who was suffering from a physical inharmony that threatened to become malignant, when all at once the thought came to her if God can't heal me, what can this do? This referred to the drug she was taking. Immediately she applied a cleansing substance to the troublous part, threw away the drugs, and from that day had no further trouble. In the forum, recently, Winifred Rhodes told of an amusing happening in India. 
It seems that a pack animal slipped on a ferry in India some years ago, and a case of medicines was spilled. The colored pills were picked up and returned to their appropriate bottles, but with the white pills, it was impossible to tell one kind from another. However, a young native gathered them up, and in spite of the missionary doctor's warning of the danger of using them ignorantly, he promptly made them the foundation of a widespread reputation. When the missionary next appeared in that region, the young native greeted him with joy. I owe all my prosperity to you, he exclaimed. It seems that the bottle containing the assorted white pills he had picked up was the favorite in his shop. Patients came from far and near to get them. And in answer to the horrified doctor's question as to how he could administer them if he didn't know what they were meant for, he announced that he gave them to patients only when he didn't know what was the matter with them. Dr. Richard C. Cabot of Harvard told a gathering of his fellow medicos the body has super wisdom and force which are biased in favor of life rather than death. What is this force? It is God, the healing power which supplies 90% of the recovery. And on another occasion, he said if nature, assisted by the proper mental and emotional moods, is capable of curing an ulcer in three or four weeks, why isn't it possible for the same force to heal the same ulcer in three or four minutes when the curative processes have been speeded up abnormally by the subjects passing through an intense religious, emotional, experience? In Man, the Unknown, Dr. Alexis Carroll told of having actually seen a cancerous growth on a man's hand cured in a few minutes. You see, underneath all its seeming hardness, life is really a kindly force. Life is love. It is supply. It is health. It has in it every element we need to satisfy any right desire. So there is no need to look to this man, or that drug, or some outside agency, for the things you need. Go to the primary cause. Go to life. Go to God. There is a time in every man's education, said Emerson, when he arrives at the conviction that he must take himself for better or for worse as his portion, that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil on that plot of ground given to him to till. The power which resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what he can do. Nor does he know until he has tried you are sick they said, but that isn't the truth and the woman shook her head. The Bible declares, He that dwelleth in God shall not say, I am sick she said. And she held to the truth through a starless night, till morning proved that her words were right. You are tired they said. But she smiled at that. How can I be tired, said she, when the only work is work for God, and he is my life, you see. And she quietly went her busy way, with a happy song in her heart all day. You are poor they said. But she only thought, how little they know. God speed the day when the world awakes to find that love is its only need. And she still maintained, as her fortune grew, not money but love if they only knew. For the world knows not of the peace that comes to a soul at one with God. It is only those who are toiling on in the path, the master trod who can feel, through the dark, that loving hand, and holding it fast can understand. What was it that made Napoleon master of most of Europe? Not native genius. Not brilliant intellect. In his class at the military academy, he stood 46th and there were only 65 in the class. The genius that made Napoleon was first his intense desire for power, and then his colossal belief in his own destiny. He had no fear in battle because he believed a bullet was not made that could kill him. He had no hesitation in attempting the seemingly impossible because he believed the very stars in their courses would stoop to sweep the obstacles from his path. You see, the secret of success lies in this, there is inside you a seed of life capable of drawing to you any element you need, to bring to fruition whatever good you desire. But like all other seeds, its shell must be broken before the kernel inside can use its attractive power. And that shell is thicker, harder, than the shell of any seed on earth. Only one thing will break it heat from within a desire so strong, a determination so intense, that you cheerfully throw everything you have into the scale to win what you want. Not merely your work and your money and your thought, but the willingness to stand or fall by the result to do or to die. Like the master when he cursed the fig tree for its barrenness, you are willing to demand of the seed of life in you that it bear fruit or perish. That is the secret of every great success. That is the means by which all of life, from the beginning of time, has won what it needed. What was it given to certain animals protective shells, to others speed, to still others a sting, to those who needed them claws or horns? What gave to the bold and strong the means to destroy? to the weak and cowardly facilities for hiding or escape. What but the seed of life in each, giving to every form of life the means that form craved to preserve its skin. 
Always the seed in each form of life responded to the call of that life give me so and so or I perish since the very creation of the earth, life has been threatened by every kind of danger. Had it not been stronger than any other power in the universe were it not indeed a part of God himself it would have perished ages ago. But God who gave it to us endowed it with unlimited resources, unlimited energy. No other force can defeat it. No obstacle can hold it back. What is it that saves men in dire extremity? who have exhausted every human resource and finally turned to God in their need. What but the unquenchable flame of God in them the seed of life he has given to each of us with power to draw to us whatever element we feel that we need to save us from extinction. What do business leaders advise young people today? Live within your income? No, indeed. Go into debt. Reach out. Spread yourself I then dig the harder to catch up. You are entitled to just as much of the good things of life as Ford or Rockefeller or Morgan or any of the rich men around you. But it is not they who owe it to you. And it is not the world that owes you a living. The world and they owe you nothing but honest pay for the exact service you render them. The one who owes you everything of good riches and honor and happiness is the seed of life inside you. Go do it. Stir it up. Don't rail against the world. You get from it what you put into it nothing more. Wake up the seed of God inside you. Demand of it that it brings you the elements you need for riches or success. Demand, and make your need seem as urgent as must have been the need of the crustacean to develop a shell, of the bird to grow wings, of the bear to give it fur. Demand and know that you receive. The seed of life in you is just as strong as ever it was in those primitive animals of prehistoric days. If it could draw from the elements, whatever means is required to enable them to survive, don't you suppose it can do the same today to provide you with the factors you consider essential to your well-being? True, these factors are different from those called for in primitive times, but do you suppose that matters to the seed of life? Everything in this world is made up of energy. Don't you suppose it is as easy to pour that energy into one mold as into another? Many seem to think that riches and success are a matter of luck. They are not lucky. They are a matter of demanding much from the seed of God inside you and then insisting upon those demands being met. The trouble with most people is that they are looking to some force outside themselves to bring them riches or happiness. The superstitious carry a rabbit's foot or an amulet, believing it will bring them luck. The religious carry medals or images or the relic of some saint. It never occurs to them that they have the means of going direct to God. God seems too impalpable, too shadowy, and far away. His apparent isolation, his seeming detachment from their workaday world, makes him appear too unsubstantial to depend upon in real need. They want something they can see and feel and talk to. Something with a substance like their own. Hence the demand for statues and pictures and shrines and relics hence, too, the need for saints and priests intercessors, nearer to the great one than ordinary mortals can hope to reach. But direct contact is always better than even the most potent intermediary. And you have direct contact, any time you want to use it. You are a tree of life. The seed of you is a seed of God part of him as much as the acorn is part of the oak. And that seed is all the properties of God, just as the acorn has all the potential properties of the oak. It can draw to you every element you need to make yours the most perfect tree in the garden, the most fruitful. So, instead of depending upon the stars, or a rabbit's foot, or an amulet, or even the saints put your faith in the seed of God, which is the animating part of you. No matter what your circumstances may be, No matter what obstacles may conspire to hold you down, look not merely to the means at hand, not to circumstances or conditions but to that never-failing power of the seed inside you to draw to you any element you believe you must have to survive. That is the way to make your star, your destiny, work for you. Only the star, the destiny, is right inside you. It is the seed of God, the seed of life in you which your desire, your faith, and your need have started into action. It is stronger than any circumstances. It can overcome any condition. So bless it and baptize it, and stir it up. Bless it morning and evening, but when the urgent need arises demand. Demand that it bestir itself. Demand that it draws to you whatever elements you need. Demand and give all as you demand all make it is a matter of life or death, survive or perish. There is a point in the tree, you know, below which the pull of the leaves has little power. That is the point to which the roots must deliver the water, or the tree will never flower or bear fruit. There is a point in your circumstances or your business at which the pull of your seed of life does not make itself felt. That is the point to which your efforts must deliver the fruit of your work, or your desire will die stillborn. So when you demand, 
first give throw every bit of effort you have into reaching the point at which the seed of life will take over the work. Give all that you can to the work in hand, and don't forget to give to the Lord as well. It is this which makes so successful the prayers of those who, demanding riches, throw all their scanty store into the plate, and depend solely upon that seed of God in them to supply their needs. When you can do this, believe, the world is yours. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile, but you have to sigh when care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must but don't you quit. Success is failure turned inside out the silver tint of the cloud of doubt, and you never can tell how close you are, it may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your hardest hit it's when things seem worse that you mustn't quit. Exercise for chapter 16 All things therefore whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, even so, do ye also unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. Someone in Omaha studied that golden rule, and out of it found the solution to much of Nebraska's jobless problem in the last big depression. He brought together a number of jobless men and women, and started them doing things to help others I forgetting their own troubles, they looked about them for ways to help others more unhappy and unfortunate than themselves and organized the All Omaha Self-Help Society. They do farming, craft work, and canning. They build houses, repair them, tend yards, do housework, care for children, and perform any service that offers which is of value to the community. Where money is available, they accept to pay for their services and turn it into wheat and flour and fuel and shelter. They have improved their condition and that of all around them, without waiting for the business to pick up or for some government agency to give them a lift. And in scores of parts of the country, similar groups have done the same. In times of quandary, when you seem at the end of your rope, if you will only stop and think a while, you will nearly always find that you have the beginnings of the solution to your problem in your mind, or somewhere ready to your hand. Use that beginning to start no matter how small a scale. Alice Foote McDougall built a business that, before the depression of the 30s, was worth $5 million. Yet she started with a little booth in Grand Central Station where she sold coffee. One blustery winter's day, everyone that came in seemed so cold and hungry that she sent home for her waffle iron and the necessary ingredients, and served waffles free to all who came for coffee. Those free waffles made her famous. They were the start that built for her a string of restaurants and a good-sized fortune. The stories of that kind we might tell are legion. There was the poor farmer's wife who gave some of the strawberry preserves she was making to a youngster from high school who had stopped by for a drink. He thought them so good that he asked if he couldn't sell some of them to neighbors. From that start, she built a profitable business. The famous Jones Farm sausage got its start from the talk of neighbors and friends, who had tasted this delicious sausage at the Jones's table. And many other successful businesses have started on as small a scale. The great thing is the start to see an opportunity for service, and start doing it, even though in the beginning you serve but a single customer and him for nothing. In life small things be resolute and great to keep thy muscles trained. Knowst thou when fate thy measure takes? Or when she'll say to thee I find thee worthy, do this thing for me.